And we are live. Welcome, Mystery and Thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to be kicking off a red-hot 2022 with one of my favorite authors and humans, Kara Ruda, here to give us the inside scoop on her chilling new thriller, racking up all the praise, Somebody's Home. Kara, welcome back. Tell us about this book. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. And, you know, it's it's uh, it's my second pandemic release. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we talked about The Next Wife during the pandemic, and, and we were kind of hopeful that we wouldn't be having to talk about somebody's home during the pandemic again, but it's fine since we're all <laughs> in our homes. And it's about a house. So there you have it. How's that? Does that sum it up? It's, it's not about the pandemic, I promise. <laughs> it's not. It's really not. But you did, uh, when we were all uh, locked at home, you did, that did influence your writing. Tell us the story about that. It really did. You know, it was during that first wave when it was really, we were all really locked down and we were washing our groceries and we didn't know where the danger was. And yeah. so I'm here, all my adult kids in their 20s had all moved back home too. So we were kind of reconstituted family, which was in a way really, I mean, I never thought we'd have that again, but also really scary because you want to protect everybody and you don't know where the scariness is coming from. Like we thought it was touch back then, not the air. But I started to think, we everybody was kind of in their room working virtually and I was up in my office up here and I'm thinking wow what is the most terrifying thing the most terrifying thing is if you feel like you're safe at home and you should but you really aren't and so that's kind of where this whole situation started with somebody's home it started there and it also um, some events that had happened around in our community uh, also are play a role in the in the in the story as well but I I don't know if I it can get, it's so hard talking about mysteries without giving anything away. So anyway, yes. So the, uh, how's that for a little intro? <laughs> Ooh, it is good, Kara. And I can't wait to get to every dirty detail because lady, you are racking up the red hot praise. Sally Hepworth, Lou Ann Rice, Heather Gudenkoff, all of them have been on the show. Plus a star review from Kirkus. My God, woman, this no. is earned and we're going to get into it. But first, I just want to welcome everyone who's watching us on Facebook, on YouTube, Murder by the the book channels my channels our private mystery and thriller maven group wherever you're watching from you're in the right place this is the right time and if you've been here before you know how this works you get to ask our featured guest anything ask her about her writing her books something she's never told anyone before let's talk to her about it she is our only guest tonight she is our soloist and we're going to talk to her i see the comments already coming in michelle Houlihan says hi from Canada. Canada. Michelle, welcome to the conversation. Thanks so much for joining us. The Peace Corps. Welcome back, friend. She says, hi from North Carolina. Always a pleasure to have you, ma'am. Leecha saying hello, ladies. Leecha, you're joining from us from Texas, I believe. Top mystery and thriller Maven member there. She says, this book sounds great. Absolutely. Leecha, I think you're going to like this one. Melissa Watson says, hi, Sarah and Kara, joining us live from Australia. We've got an international crew. Yeah. Tonight. We got Canada. We got the U.S. We got Australia. Up, oh, Stephanie Cooper. She is, of course, the fabulous bookstagrammer at Fire Pit and Books, jumping in from California. Stephanie, your, your fellow California girl here, uh, Kara, joining us from Laguna. And the questions are already pouring in. Leecha would like to know, Kara, do your book characters talk to you? And if they do, have you had to change something in the story because of it? Cool question, Leecha. That is a cool question, Leecha. Okay, so yes, I'm a pantser. So my characters speak to me the whole time. They usually, one of them will pop into my head and usually that's how it starts. And then probably a title of the book and then we're off to the races. So they will surprise me almost every day I'm writing. And that's what's so fun about being a pantser. I, you know, I kind of have a sense, <laughs> I kind of a sense of what I'm, I'm going to or going for, but then they can just, kind of veer off. I will say if they get one of my books when I was writing during the pandemic and actually somebody's home as well, they tend to get really dark if like the world's kind of in a dark place. So I have to maybe steer them back from being, you know, too nasty. So, so my guys, I have to corral them every once in a while. 
Corralling sounds good. Stephanie Cooper says she is so jealous. She loves Laguna slash Newport. She says she's in California in Clovis, which is the Fresno area. Very cool. Um, and I just want to clarify that a, a pantser, tell us what a pantser means. Or what, break that down for us because it sounds like something. <laughs> oh, okay. So pantsers are people who write by the seat of their pants as opposed to an out. Now, I will tell you that if those are plotters, so there's plotters and pantsers and then a combination of which is where I'm trying to get to because my agents really want me to let me let them know where I'm going before I go there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I've learned it's better for me to let them have like a light outline. So I'm trying to learn how to do light outlining and just kind of give them a heads up and then they can give me feedback before my characters and I go to town. It, so I'm, I'm trying to learn old dog new tricks, but yeah, so that's what a pantser is. And it's so fun. I am me. also trying to learn that lesson care because I don't plot either. And it has, it has been a long and winding road that Devella doesn't want to go down again. And also old dog, <laughs> also new tricks. And it ain't easy. Um, Lisa is saying, thank you so much for answering my questions. I love your answer. Yay. Stephanie said she's never heard of a pantser. That's <laughs> amazing. Really cool. Now let's talk a little bit about, and by the way, y'all, I just want to say Stephanie's reviews are lit. See what I did there? Cause she is fire pit and books. I'm putting a link to her Instagram right here. Her reviews are so great and her pictures are fabulous. So if you love books and you love bookstagrams, go follow that cool cat. Um, Kara, let's talk about this panting though. If you're not plotting, which I'm not either, do you ever find yourself stuck? I do. And then you're like, ah, oh, crap, how am I going to get out of this? You got to back, back, back it up. I mean, what's that look like? I don't know. You know, it's funny. I, I, that's not as much of a problem that I've had. I, my characters are usually pretty driven and clear. My problem will be if my characters aren't acting the way like my agents expected them to. <laughs> I've gotten all the way through the book. So I think I, we talked about this in The Next Wife. I had turned in the book and I was all excited about it. And then my agents were like, I don't know if we need to hear from the daughter. And I'm like, oh, she really wants to. And then I took her all out of the book and then we submitted it. And then my editor at the publisher is like, I really think we need to hear from the daughter in the book. So anyway, so I think that is what plotters get to avoid. If You know, I'm just speaking to both of us really. So that's why I'm trying to learn a little bit about plotting and, you know, just to give people a heads up and get the bigger picture before you write it all. Excellent. Very cool. Thank you for that inside scoop. Jelkel is saying the in-between are known as plantsers in Australia by some. The ones that do some pantsing and some plotters, some okay. plotting, excuse me. Um, Kara, do you see yourself being a being a planter? Are you headed to full on plotter town? No, no, I'm not doing plotter. I'm I would like to be a planter. I think that would be a great place. I've never heard that term. So thank you for that. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. I'm working my way towards planter. Truth be told, though, I have been known to write the entire book and then write the outline, <laughs> then submit the outline and then then, you know, modify the whole thing from there. But I love planter. That's what I'm going to go with. I'm going to go with planter. Okay, so uh, it's planter or bust on exactly. the, <laughs> on the next book. All it. right, keep those questions going. You know, this is your time to talk to your author. So every Monday, I give you my two handpicked authors tonight. We have just one. She's a solo act. Um, so this is your time to ask Kara anything. Now, I want to talk to you about the fabulous praise that this book is racking up. So Sally Hepworth, who has been on the show, she is, of course, the New York Times bestselling author of The Good Sister and coming up, The Younger Wife, declared that this is a truly unput downable novel that had me gripped and anxious from the first sentence, captivating, fast paced, I'm popping this up here, and unsettling, somebody's home is astonishingly, astonishingly good. I gulped it down. <laughs> Yum. Okay, let's talk about how uh, how you create a book that's, that someone like, let's say, Sally Hepworth gulps down. How do you think, what do you think the key to creating anxiety in the reader on the page is? How'd you do it? Gosh, I don't know. I was so honored by that blurb because I'm such a fan of Sally's that I'm like, oh my gosh, she liked it. You know, it was, it was, it was amazing. So I really appreciate it. 
But I guess I think the key to me in any kind of suspense novel is that if you, I mean, for me, it's if I feel nervous when I'm writing it, then I feel like perhaps the people who are reading it will feel the same way. So I think it is some kind of sense of, of the pace of the of the story and, and keeping it moving. I like to make my stories take place in two or three days. Um, best day ever was one day. The, somebody's home is over three days. It's a weekend. So I think that helps too with like a compressed time. Um, at least it helps me as an author because I know that, you know, so when Sunday comes, it's the end of the book. So we've got to, we've got to keep everything moving forward. Oh, I love that. That's so interesting. I hadn't thought about the possibility of compressed time uh, adding to that that excitement, that thrill, that that time pressure. That's really cool to know. Um, I want to remind you guys, this book isn't even out yet. This is Kara's very first event of the year, her very first event for this book. We're so honored to have her. Kara, thank you so much for coming on, for giving, for giving us that honor. Um, uh, it is out next Tuesday, and you can grab your copy from this woman-owned independent bookstore, Murder by the Book. Um, so I'm putting, I'm popping the link in the comments. So click, click over, pre-order it now. And next Tuesday, Murder by the Book will send you your copy and it is good. Um, Alicia would like to know, Kara, do you have the book title before or after you write the book? Cool. Tell us about the story of the title. Yeah, this, the titles usually come to me about the same time that the primary character does. So that, that's been really fun too. And without exception, except for the best day ever, the publisher has changed it a bit, but I kind of like having the notion of the title as I'm writing, even if it ends up getting modified um, at the end of the day, it, it kind of, for me, it gives a framework or something. I don't know really what that is, but I think the character that comes to mind also has a title in mind. So <laughs> in that weird author way, I think it's, that's like the structure that, that works for me. Oh, very cool. Thank you for that. Uh, Stephanie said, I just grabbed somebody's home and I will read it before next week so I can post about it on Pub Day. How exciting. Stephanie, that's amazing. Thank, Thank you, you so much. That's so nice. really cool. Thank you. Um, just skimming through, making sure I didn't miss anything. Oh, the Peace Corps, by the way, I love your name, uh, so your cool. handle there. <laughs> So cool. She would like to know, when did you decide you wanted to be a writer and does your younger self ooh, ever play a part in your books? Kara, give us a skinny. Yeah. All right. Well, in third grade, our teacher asked us to write to the person that you wanted to become. And in third grade, my favorite author was Robert McCloskey of Make Way for Ducklings. We were living in Boston. And I so I wrote to him and I said, OK, Mr. McCloskey, I, I want to be an author someday. And he wrote me back and he said, well, little Kara, next time you should do your research better because I'm an illustrator, not an author. But good luck to you. So. That was my first time, but it did make an impression on me because clearly, I, you know, you remember that. And I still have that letter someplace I should find it. But I knew I wanted to be an author and I, I didn't go right straight into becoming an author. After college, I was an English major and studied Southern Lit at um, Vanderbilt University. It was great, but I didn't really have the confidence, I guess, to have a byline or like to put my own words out there. My first... Um, kind of chance to do that it was as a reporter. So I was a reporter first. I wrote, and um, then from then I went into marketing and I've written every kind of copy from radio and television spots to like you name it, manuals for electronics that don't even exist anymore. Anyway, so I guess I, I've always been writing. That's just been the, the heart of who I am. So I think probably to second to, to the second part of your question, I think everything in your life plays a role in what you write. And it's not in like a memoir type way, but your orientation to the world is what you, what flows through your characters in any work of fiction. And so every everything that I was and am kind of comes through in my characters and kind of the orientation, if that makes sense. Oh, I love that. the or, Your orientation to the world comes yeah. through. That's so interesting. Which character of your of all your books do you think most comes through? Gosh, that's a tough question because I have a lot of creepy characters. <laughs> it might be the inverse of my characters. I don't know. I, I tend to write uh, a lot of men who are um, sexist and not so great. And that all comes from my experience in the working world with a really, really spectacular series of 
completely horrible bosses. So that is all like in the back of my head. And so it just doesn't mean I don't like guys. It's not true. I like good guys, but uh, I happen to have a lot of experience with that. You know, and each book is different. I'd say in somebody's home, I really like the mom characters. They're both very different. There's a woman named Julie Jones, and she's leaving her loveless marriage and starting over. And she, her daughter Jess is a senior in high school, and she realizes she's running out of time to like make sure they're bonded, make sure she's clear with her about like her choices and priorities. So she's moving to a new home. And the new home happens to belong to Sandy Dean, who's also a mom of two younger boys, but she also adopted a son from her, her husband, Pat Doug had with their, his first marriage. So she adopts this older guy, Tom. And when you meet them in the story, Sandy's moved out of her home that she loved and nurtured the garden and the hummingbirds and everything. And, and that's the home Julia's bought. And the only problem is uh, the son, Tom, the 20 something year old Tom has decided he's not leaving and he's a resident of the carriage house out back. So I kind of, I think what I relate to in this story is just from the perspective of moms who will do anything for their kids and, and try to do their best. So probably Julie and Sandy are my most, uh, I don't know. I, I, I feel bad for them and I wish them well. I don't know what's going to happen though. Well, I do, but you don't. <laughs> you don't. Is, she feels bad for them and then she twists the knife mercilessly. Yeah, I know, I know. A little more. My poor people. Yeah. Alicia says, thank you again for answering my questions. Yeah. The Peace Corps is, says that she is, oh, a piecer. She's a quilter. Oh, very Oh, that's cool. perfect. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Oh, Anisa Joy Armstrong, Bookstagrammer Extraordinaire, says, hello, Sarah and Kira. Hi, Anisa. Hi. Welcome to the conversation. So great to have you. As always, Stephanie says, Kara seems so sweet. She can't possibly <laughs> have a creep be side. I know. Kara, Look, you're can be deceiving. I know. <laughs> My husband says he sleeps with one eye open because, you know, like, I I, I don't know why I, I feel like I I am creepy though, Stephanie. I don't know what happened, but my daughter's like, mom, you need to write about happy things. I'm like, no, this is really happy for me, actually. I think it's kind of cathartic. It's a way to process the world in a fictional way, especially when things are kind of out of whack. And, and, and that is why Somebody's Home, it's probably my darkest book I've written so far, but it was because we were in that scariest part of the pandemic. Exactly, exactly. Oh my goodness. Um, and, and again, she looks sweet and blonde, but she's back there. <laughs> <laughs> with a knife, wielding a knife, thinking of all sorts of murder and mayhem. Yeah. Um, Anissa was also wondering if you are a plotter or a pantser. And tell us, tell, let's hear it again. Why, why, why are you the? Why are you a, a pantser and, and and your journey toward plantser? <laughs> Aren't I a plantser now? I think I am. So yeah, we just found out that in Australia, it, the person in the middle is called plantser, which I'm going to strive to become. Right now, I'm a pantser, although my editor and my agents want me to be a plotter, so I'm going to move into the middle with light plotting. But I, I, I really feel like if I if I do too much plotting, the like spunk of my characters kind of recedes. I don't know. Do you feel like that too, Sierra? Yes. That's why I've never. I've always told myself, oh, I'm an artist. Like I can't possibly limit myself by plotting. I, I have to be free. I'm a I'm a peacock, man. I've got to fly. Um, but I think that I think that that has actually made my life harder. And then I end up having to spend all of this time painfully rewriting because I didn't get it right the first time. Right. Um, so I am I'm going for. I, I am destined for hashtag plotter town. Um, yeah. <laughs> and Nisa's is an amazing uh, bookstagrammer. She does a lot with friends in fiction. She does a lot with Jenna Bush Hagar. She's amazing. Give her, check her out as well. I'm plopping her a link um, in in the comments as well. She is Anissa Joy on Instagram. Ooh, Melissa Watson would like to know what inspires you for your next book and how do you come up with these nasty characters that she loves so much? I know, I, and I really, I, I don't know where they come from. They're like rolling around in my brain. I, I, it, they'll just pop up. And um, that's what's, to me, the fun of this. And even if you move more towards plotting, Sarah, I think just that that notion of the character and that fun that you feel when you feel that person, that fictional person coming alive, that's, that's the best thing in the world. So anyway, so don't worry. You can still plot a little bit and keep that 
heart, you know, the heart of the character, I think. So um, my, yeah, I, you know, again, so I don't know my, all right, well, let's say, okay, The Widow, which is my next book, it's coming out in November. I, that's a new setting for me. So typically I've been writing, Somebody's Home is set in Southern California, where I live now. And like the next wife was set in Columbus, Ohio, where I lived for a very long time. The Widow is my first book set in Washington, D.C., where I got to spend some time when my husband was in Congress. So I think maybe my characters are, uh, uh, maybe they bubble up from place because I, once I get to know a place, then I feel comfortable having a character appear there. So I've, I've never really thought of it that way, but I think that might be, that might be where I'm, where I'm getting my people from, from the place where they are set. Oh, I love that. Thanks for the great question, Melissa. As always, appreciate you having here. The Peace Corps is saying thank you as well. Stephanie Cooper is laughing out loud. She says she is freaking deceased. <laughs> ha ha ha. ha. Um, our goal is to entertain you, to make you laugh. <laughs> Uh, to keep to keep you entertained here every Monday night, Stephanie. Thank you for joining us. As always, we appreciate you. Um, uh, Stephanie's also going to give it a follow. Thank you, ma'am. Kira, let's get into your reviews because you are earning all the praise. So uh, Lucinda Berry, best-selling author of The Perfect Child, said somebody's home kept me riveted from the first page to the last to the last a gripping psychological thriller you don't want to miss now that is a that is something that a lot of people uh strive for and they don't make it through the murky middle um we've all had that experience where we pick up a book and we're ooh, we're into it and then you know put put it doesn't it doesn't keep it going what do you think the um what do you think the secret is to keeping that momentum to keeping uh, to keeping lucinda and the rest of us riveted through the end i mean i think it's it's a, like i said earlier i think it's a function of, of pace obviously and i like to use a condensed timeline because that mm -hmm. helps me as an author keep the pace going i think it's also about having characters that people can root for or care about. A lot of times people do not like my characters. My people tend to really honk a lot of people off. So I'll get like a two-star review because they were mad at my character. I'm like, I'm really sorry, <laughs> but if you felt that positively about it, somebody, okay, anyway. Um, but I, th I think that's it. I think it's um, the characters, obviously the pace. I think um, people these days are a little distracted and it's an unsettling time. So to, to have a reader commit to my book is, is such an honor really. And so I try to, I try my best to do everything possible from the end of the chapter to the first sentence of the next chapter to make you want to keep going along for the ride and caring about it. And in this book, I have a lot of characters. So there's um, Julie and her daughter, Jess and Sandy and her husband, Doug. So I, hopefully I have a perspective in there that you'll find somebody that you can despise as well as somebody that you can root for. <laughs> I love that. Some, someone we can despise and someone and we somebody can root, root for. Fabulous. Yeah. Stephanie saying she just finished one of Lucinda's books today. She absolutely loves her. Well, yeah. ch check that out. Lucinda's raving about Kara's book. So very so nice. cool. Um, I, I love hearing that. Um, another one that I really, um, oh, Anissa is saying that she loves the ride that you take your readers on. Um, so she is, she's, she's buckling up and she is, she is <laughs> here for, she is here for it. Thank you, Anissa, for the comment. Um, another one that I really loved, uh, and there are many to admire here, is um, from Luann Rice. Luann, of course, an amazing, amazing author, most recently of The Shadow. Shadow box. Um, she has been on the show as well. And she, I'm posting it right here in the comments. She said that somebody's home starts like a hurricane out at sea, some wind, some waves, a sense of approaching danger, but the story moves fast, gains velocity. And suddenly you are turning the pages, unable to stop heart in your throat, knowing that something terrible is going to happen and nothing will stop it. The threats come from all sides and it's so hard to know who to trust. The characters are wonderful and complex. The setting feels like the house next door which makes it all the more terrifying and the ending nearly killed me <laughs> uh, Kara Ruda has written a terrific gripping thriller 
what is that when you got her review when you got her her rave were you just i mean were you crying were you laughing were you did you break open the champagne i mean what was that like you know, well you know it's it's so amazing um i i've never met her and i hope to someday but the um so that was through my agents asked her agents and um anyway to get to get those kind of words from someone who I admire so much. It's, it really is. And, you know, we all know the author community is such an amazing, supportive community, but it takes a lot of time to read somebody else's book and put those words together and send them on. So I really, really appreciate everyone who blurbed it. And, you know, yeah. And I love that one too. I mean, I love this, how, how she just wrote a story in her blurb. <laughs> it's great. I really did. She was like, and now she was like, it was a dark and stormy night. It started yeah. out at sea. <laughs> yeah. Started, yeah. Um, I know. I love that. So in my mystery and thriller mavens group, I let people submit questions in advance because not everyone can make it live and that's totally okay. People watch it later. So um, Marcy Ann Cagle, who is the amazing founder of the Nashville Girls Group on Facebook. She is also a fantastic Instagrammer with 29,000 passionate followers on Instagram. She is, of course, shiver me pink. And she would like to know, um, if you see yourself continuing to write thrillers, or is there another genre that you'd ever like to take a stab at? You know, I, I love, I love this genre. This is kind of where I, I, I don't know, it's, it's where I first started out writing. And then I had a little two year segue into romance, which I love too. I love meeting all the authors who write romance, but I found that I'm not really good at sex scenes. So that's a little hindrance. <laughs> writing romance. I mean, I didn't ever have a, okay, long story. Anyway, and I did, I started out in women's fiction, but as I continued to write, my novels kept getting darker and darker and darker until I kind of landed with Best Day Ever being kind of my breakout book. And I, I think I'm where I'm supposed to be now. I, I really do enjoy it. I, you know, I so admire historical fiction authors and I'd love to do that. I have a story from my grandma that I would love to to have come to life someday. But for right now, I'm really, really enjoying suspense. Oops, I was I had myself muted. I had myself muted because I was I was typing the link to uh, to Marcy's Instagram. I didn't want you to hear me typing, um, but she said after you answer the after she answers the question, tell her that I hope she never leaves thrillers. They are my favorite. Aww, um, Marcy thank you, and yeah. Kegel, thank you for the for the fabulous question and, and thank you for that answer, ma'am. Yeah, and I love Nashville, so that's what, you know wherever you go to college, you just like find it to be home. And so that's nice to hear from you. Thanks, Marcy. Yay. Melissa saying she hates sex scenes. <laughs> Kara, what did you find uh, so challenging? I myself have struggled to write them because it, you want them to be, wait for it, sexy, but actually they just can't come out kind of awkward because when you're trying to describe the action, he, you know, her hand went yeah. here and it's, it's, it's cringe. Yeah, I am. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, it just wasn't my, I mean, I like the um, romance part and like the dating part and, uh, but the, you know, then the doors just got to close and <laughs> there can be no more. And most of my people are beyond um, the infatuation stage in my scary books now. So I don't have to worry about that part. Yeah. Excellent, excellent, uh, and fair enough. Yeah, because it's it's hard, it's awkward, and you know it's what's really interesting awkward. is, um, I have actually learned that that the mystery and thriller writers don't like much sex in their stories. They want to skip to that part. They want to skip those parts. They they skim it. And actually, I had Kate White, who was the former editor of Cosmopolitan. So there's a lady who knows her way around a sex. She can story. write a sex story. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And she said that what she learned, she very early on in her career, she was writing a lot of steamy sexies. And then she learned from her reviews that people didn't like that in the mystery and thriller community. They were skimming past it. They didn't want that those steamy scenes. So she started doing that, as you said, and then the doors closed. <laughs> <laughs> and her readers appreciated that more, which I think is is so interesting. Yeah, um, I think just use your imagination and then carry on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Carry on. Exactly, exactly. 
Um, and we have a uh, question from the incredible Christina Cook. She is the founder of Bitchy Bookworms on Facebook, a passionate, engaging, enthusiastic community of 68 thousand passionate readers and she would like to know where do you get your inspiration to keep coming up with these stories book after book she'd like a sneak peek into that please yeah i know and i guess i think i found the answer maybe place is one thing like settings i i've always been fascinated by what's beneath the surface of seemingly perfect lives so you know like kind of the facade which social media allows everyone to have even more of now these days um than ever that and the intersection of that and probably some true crime stuff that is you know that you you watch or see or I don't know it's just it'll be something that um, sparks my imagination and then I'll usually it'll come in the middle of the night with <laughs> this story idea and I'll write down on this little notepad ineligibly usually um, what what the idea is and then I'll wake up in the morning I'm like what does that say what is that and then I have to let, let it rest a little bit and then it'll come back again so that's usually how it happens but I mean what, what exactly triggers it I don't know but I do know ideas are everywhere if you're just if you want to write a story just open yourself up and there are stories abound they just really do and it's some kind of combination of your worldview like i said before your personal experiences what interests you i mean i think if you're going to spend 300 pages with characters it should be some kind of topic or they, they should get into situations that interest you too. So that's that's what I've been lucky so far with my ideas that I'm really interested along with my characters to find out what's going to happen. Ooh. Now when you're sleeping and the ideas come to you, are you is it in that space of 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 between sleep and sleep and wakefulness or you're sound asleep and you sit sound both upright and <laughs> and you reach for the pen because you've got this brilliant idea. Oh yeah, sound asleep. And my husband again is like, "What?" you doing you know but i'm also like a sleep talker sleepwalker so i'm a very active sleep person oh yeah and i'll i'll he'll be like while you sat up in bed and started cracking up again i'm like really <laughs> so i don't know what i'm doing i and my my grandparents i come from a long line of sleep uh, walkers sleep talkers so it's a strong gene mm -hmm. wow so wait do you actually find yourself outside standing by the fridge like you find yourself in different places is that scary yeah. i haven't i haven't as as much lately like wandered off but um yeah when i was younger it was very strong gene and i would find myself in different places around our house <laughs> growing up just like because doors would thwart me somehow or and then i i do know at one time i went down and asked the babysitter like for a glass of milk in like a really scary way. Like, can I have a glass of milk? And you know, it was really demanding. And I don't remember any of it. My parents were like, you were not nice to the babysitter. I'm like, what? Oh, and then I was on a vacation with one, a boyfriend's family. And we were staying in like, I was staying with this, this with his sister in one room. And then, you know, the family was all different rooms in this like hotel kind of situation. And I went to sleep. I woke up in someone else's hotel room, this older couple. I was just sitting on their bed. So that was that was probably my scariest one, but I should. Oh my them. god! They left. The, first of all, you left. They left their door I, open, and you yes. just you and just I strolled in. Them. Yeah. Oh my god! That's I mean, so weird. It's Internet. so weird. Yeah. So, but right now, now I think I only like sit. I I have like sat up and screamed before. This <laughs> was like, oh my god. So yeah, it's it's kind of maybe. Maybe I should write about this. Oh my God, you should totally write about this because yeah. I wonder if because you are such a, you walk in your sleep, you talk in your sleep, you have brilliant ideas in your sleep. I mean, this is so crazy and so cool. I love it. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. This is really, really um, funny. Um, another question that was submitting in advance, I'm just pulling it up right now. And she, um, uh, let me find it here. She, uh, this is from Carrie White, and she is on Instagram. Carrie reads them all, and oh, yeah. she submitted a question uh, in advance as well. And I'm just skimming to make sure I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't miss it here because the questions are coming in so fast. You guys, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Um, okay, she said, 
She said, first of all, please tell her I own and adore all of her books. Aww. And she would like to know, what do you do to combat writer's block? She's a two-part question. So let's let's start there. Um, what do you do to combat writer's block? Do you ever find yourself sitting there just completely stymied, frustrated, not uh, – words aren't coming? Yeah, you know what, what I've – what I think and what I've learned is that you have to be nice to your muse. I mean, she's a very fragile, happy, creative person inside you. And if the words aren't coming that day, it's okay not to write. And I, I don't subscribe to the, um, you know, have to write from 6 a.m. to noon every day. I don't have a rigid schedule like that because I feel like, I mean, now that the kids are grown too, I have a lot more flexibility. I used to be writing, you know, at night when they were, after they went to bed and all that kind of thing. But I've found that if, if you are feeling writer's block, the best thing to do is just go for a walk or get away from your desk. Um, you know, just, just don't force yourself because the more you try to force yourself, the more your little muse inside is like, Meh, and gets a little cranky. So it's, uh, that, that would be my advice to writer's block is, don't let it bother you. And I don't really believe in it anyway. I think it's just your brain saying I need a break. Oh, interesting. Because uh, something else that happens is sometimes I do try to be kind to myself, but then three days later, I'm still being kind to myself and the pages aren't getting <laughs> the pages. I'm too kind to myself. Yeah. Um, but the pages aren't getting, aren't getting written. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you're on deadline, obviously you've got to keep cranking, but I mean, if, if you can treat yourself with kindness and your muse will be happier, I think. Oh, I love that. Treat yourself with kindness. The second part of Carrie's question um, is, she's, she said, um, do any real life experiences find your way into your books? She would like to know if so, which? So you said places have found their way into books. Yeah. What about specific life experiences? I know. I'm trying to think. I I do. Well, okay. So in Next Wife, um, she was working in a business. Uh, Kate, the first wife, and John built a business together. And that's where we find them um, launching an IPO. And my husband and I did run a company together. And it's like, you know, kind of all the stress and uh, all of that was, was in that story, but hopefully fictionalized and turned into a, a fun story. In somebody's home, I guess probably because I have been around the real estate industry for a long time. That's what, what our, our company was about. The notion that home should be a safe place and that the whole feeling of moving to a new home and what all of that entails. And for Julie and my, in somebody's home, she's, you know, she's making a fresh start. It's all exciting and positive. So definitely that played a role in it too. Just that whole, ah, I'm starting over and, and here's my new adventure. And then, of course, um, when it doesn't go exactly as planned, I, I haven't ever heard of that happening. But I don't, I don't know. Maybe people do get left behind in the carriage house. <laughs> I don't know if that happens or not. It, it really shouldn't. But anyway, so I, I guess that does. So there are like, like I said, I think every experience that you have in your life, especially maybe bad ones are back in the back of your brain. And as you process them, like all my bad bosses, they have come out as voices in, in some of my nasty male characters. And it's a way to kind of process them and get them out of there. Ooh, I love that. And so far, uh, the husband and wife real estate team um, has not resulted in one murdering the other. So that's a that's a good thing. And let's call it... <laughs> Yeah. We had to sell the company, so that that was good. <laughs> that was you good. sold we the company and everyone lived, so definitely. Yes, everyone win. lived, yes. <laughs> win, win. Carrie White Shields, uh, thank you for your fabulous questions submitted in advance to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. She is, of course, Carrie reads them all. She's a Mystery and Thriller bookstagrammer, so I just plopped her link in the comments. So give her a follow, y'all. She has great pictures, great reviews. Check them out. She reviewed Karen's book, yeah. uh, Somebody's um, so you'll be wanting to see that. Okay, we have five minutes left. I think we got time for one or two more questions. So get them going in the comments, wherever you're watching from, pop them in and I'll get them right over to her. While you're typing, I'm going to read another review. This one from Georgina Cross. She said, trust your instincts and grab a copy of somebody's home. In Ruta's la latest thriller, a mother trusts her instincts when she knows the person on her property is threatening her family. But what if the threat is coming at her from all sides and more than one person is hiding a dark secret, a compulsive family? 
podcast to read somebody's home reveals what people will do to protect not only their homes, but the families within those four walls. A captivating read. Georgina is, of course, a fabulous thriller writer, most recently of The Stepdaughter. Um, Stephanie is saying she's already following her. She is awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Georgina also just regram one of Stephanie's red hot fiery pit fire pit books. <laughs> so check that out. It's a small and fabulous world. It is. Um, any last questions, y'all? I'm just skimming through, making sure I don't didn't miss any. Um, and I just want to say there the one other I wanted to squeeze in is from Kat St. John. She's also been on the show. She said this is taught with foreboding from the very first page. Rude as somebody's home is an unsettling portrait of an antisocial man, a master of the universe, and the woman caught between them. The rotating points of view and incisive clear writing are sure to keep you flipping the pages until you reach the shocking conclusion. I loved that. I loved that book. Oh my gosh, wait, I'm sorry. I have to read one more because this was from Heather Gudenkoff, and she's coming on in just uh, two weeks on January 24th to talk about her brand new book, The Overnight Guest. And I loved hers as well. She said, this is an intriguing cast of characters and a killer promise. I love a, I love a pun. I am here for it. Um, and she went on to say that um, Somebody's Home is a thriller worth staying all up night for. All staying up all night for fast paced and relentless. Ruta cranks up the tension with the turn of every page with unexpected twists and jaw dropping revelations, which is, of course, our favorite kind of revelations. Yes. Ruta knows how to draw <laughs> readers close and keep them entranced. Wow. Heather Gudenkoff, New York Times bestselling author of The Overnight Guest, will be on the show in two weeks, and she gave this one a rave review, y'all. Um, welcome, Shirley. Welcome, Benjamin. Welcome, Anita. Welcome, Jerry. Welcome, Pam. So great to have you all. Connie, thanks for stopping by. Lissa, Casey, Shari, Patricia, Deborah. Thanks for coming. Jess, Amanda. Oh, my goodness. Thank you all for all your comments. Anita, Ashton, Linda, Ricky, Betty, Donna, Jell. Oh, my gosh. Patty, John. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So good to see you. Sybil, I'm sorry I met, missed you there. Mary, Lee, Tara, Irma, Lisa, Allie. Yay. Welcome, Audrey. So great to have you all. I hope I didn't miss anybody. Thank you all for stopping by. All right. We have one more question. Allie, great to see you. Thanks for coming. Um, if you have one more question, let me know. Otherwise, I have one more submitted in advance. Uh, this person would like to remain anonymous. She's a shy one. And she would like to know, she said, I'm an aspiring author and like to know what your best advice is. Lisa says, thank you so much for this awesome chat. Lisa, Lisa, always a pleasure to have you, ma'am. Thanks for joining us. Carol, what's your best advice for an aspiring author? Um, my advice would be don't give up because I think the only way that you won't become a published author is if you give up. And there's so many different ways to do it these days, too. I mean, there's small press, there's big publishers, there's self-publishing. There are lots of options, but I do know that the only way that you won't succeed is if you give up. That's my advice. Oh, I absolutely love that. I love that because it's so hopeful. You know, we all have had different chapters. I had a corporate career. Kara, you had a corporate career. We've all had different chapters. And as you said, that all infuses and enriches our writing so it's there is no wasted time and just and keep keep at it melissa is saying thank you melissa always a pleasure for to have you thank you so much for joining us all the way from from australia um thank you all so much and i think that is a perfect note to end on also we are out of time Peace Corps saying thank you for another great evening. Barbie, always a pleasure to have you, ma'am. Thank you for joining us from YouTube. So lovely to have you as always. Y'all, I'll be back next week with Lars Kepler, Marie Rutkowski, and mystery journalist and book critic Aline Cogdill, who writes for Publishers Weekly, Shelf Awareness, and The Sun Sentinel in Florida. She's going to tell us her favorite picks for 2021, the ones that didn't make it, almost did and the one she's most excited about for 2022. Be sure to join me next Monday at 3 p.m., 7 p.m., and 8 p.m. Eastern. Anissa is saying, thank you, ladies. This was such an exciting night. Anissa, such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Anissa is an amazing bookstagrammer, a book influencer here, and a moderator of uh, Mystery and Thriller Mavens. I want to remind you all that the book is out next Tuesday. Grab your copy tonight, and the good folks at Murder by the Book will... <laughs> Uh, will be 
Uh, we'll send them out to you next Tuesday. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to buy one lucky winner a copy. So drop your comments. If you haven't already commented and you were here, drop a comment in there just so I can see that you were there. And I will pick randomly a winner by Friday and send you a copy of this book. Have a great night, you all. Jay Robinson, thank you for joining us. We appreciate having you here. Thank you all for joining us. What a pleasure to have you. And I'll see you next Monday for Hashtag Mystery Monday. Because you know Mondays can be murder. Lee just says congratulations <laughs> on your um, upcoming release, Ms. Ruda. All right, everybody, have a great night. See you next Monday. Thanks, everybody. And that is a wrap. Yay. Oh, catch a clue saying such a fun.